So turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 8. Uh, we are going to go back to uh, the book of Romans. We've taken a little break as we uh, uh, just kind of tried to, one, figure some of these this stuff out in the, this pandemic and to, to celebrate Easter. But we're going to uh, go back to the book of Romans today, Romans 8, uh, verses 12 to 17 this morning. Uh, Paul presents an issue, a problem, a difficulty in his life in chapter 7 of Romans. And I'm just going to read one verse from chapter 7, Romans 7, 15. Paul says, For I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Let me ask you, and you can answer. Answer on Facebook, Instagram, type it in, let me know. But can you relate to the Apostle Paul in that difficulty? Have you ever... Uh, uh, whatever it may be, whatever sin, whatever whatever holds you or traps you or keeps you down, uh, or just a, a time of difficulty, maybe in the midst, even uh, in this pandemic, you know, uh, uh, some of you I know as you're as you're teaching school in a new way, as you're sharing uh, uh, experiences and working remotely, you're at home with your kids and and family more often without any break. Maybe maybe you've seen some things come out that you don't particularly like. Maybe you've responded to people in ways that you don't particularly like. Maybe you've responded to the, this virus pandemic, uh, shopping, whatever it may be, uh, even responded to political leaders and state, local, all these folks who are making decisions responded in ways, maybe on Facebook to how other people respond, but you've responded in ways that you don't like, and maybe you're even surprised that you would react the way that you have. Uh, uh, I know that I can relate on uh, sometimes on a daily basis to Paul's dilemma when he says, I do the things I hate and I don't do the things I want to do. Because let's be totally honest, most of us, most of the time, know what we should do. There are times when we're not quite sure what the right answer, right response. There are times when we, we have to dig into the Word and we have to take time to pray before we make a decision. But on a daily basis, most of our daily decisions, we know how we should react. When somebody cuts us off in traffic, we know how we should react. When our kids are running around and screaming and yelling and throwing toys at us, not that I have any experience in that, we know how we should react. When somebody hurts our feelings, when we're alone and face temptation, uh, uh, whatever that temp temptation to watch something we shouldn't watch, temptation to be lazy, temptation to perfectionism, temptation to overwork, temptation that, that, that what, whatever it may be, temptation in our minds and with our hands, we know what we should do and what we should say. We know how we should react, but far too often, we do the exact opposite. We do the very thing that we know we shouldn't and the thing that we know will destroy us and the things that we hate. If you can relate to that, take a little bit of comfort in knowing that the Apostle Paul could relate as well. And that's really part of his response to this dilemma. This is really most of chapter 7 and even the beginning of chapter 8. He's dealing with this struggle and answering the question, how do we do that? How uh, do we live in light of what Jesus Christ has done for us? How do we, to use the language that we've been using in Colossians this, this whole week, how do we walk by the Spirit, live in the knowledge of God's will for our lives? How can we live the Christian life when we continually do the things that we hate, the things that destroy us, the things that we know will bring us down? If you can relate to that, you're in good company. Paul, the Apostle Paul is not the only one to struggle with that. I'm not the only one to struggle with it. You're not the only one to struggle with it. Every single Christian, every single child of God through the history of mankind has struggled with this difficulty. And part of Paul's answer is found in Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. So I'll read that with me if you would. Paul says, So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. 
You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children's also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Paul's answer to this struggle, this difficulty of doing the things that he hates, doing the things that he knows he shouldn't, is, 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 is laid out for us here. And in order to live in light of the life that God has called us to, in order, again, as, as Paul says in Colossians, to walk by the knowledge of God's will, we have to first understand what, how we defeat death in our lives, how we live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And, and to, to illustrate that, I'm going to share a point. I'm, I've called it, and if you're a Spider-Man fan, then you'll love this, but, but I, I've entitled this point, With Great Power Comes Great Responsibility, right? Look at these uh, 12 and 13 that Paul gives. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. With great power comes great responsibility. In Jesus Christ, we have the greatest gift to ever be given in this world, in this universe. We have life in Jesus Christ. We no longer have to live by our flesh, by our sin, by Satan's stand. We no longer have to to be uh, ruled by the world. We no longer have to be ruled by our passions and our emotions. We are ruled by Jesus Christ, and he gives us the power and the ability to defeat the, those passions. His power frees us from living a life of sin. Do you understand that? It's not just salvation for eternity, not just being forgiven for your sins, but in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit living in us and the power and the ability to walk by that Spirit, to walk in the knowledge of God's will and no longer live under the power of sin. Somebody should say amen to that if they're not already amen. saying that. We have the ability and the power and the privilege. We could even say we have the obligation to live in this power that's in us. But with that power, with that gift, with that glory that we have in Jesus, we have a responsibility. Now, let me pause for a minute. I'm not saying that you have the responsibility to save yourself. I'm not saying that you have the responsibility to live a certain way in order to be saved. But once you are saved, once you accept the gift from Jesus Christ, once you claim the name of Jesus and claim to be a Christian, you have a decision to make every single day. Are you going to kill, mortify, destroy, annihilate, put to death your own desires and choose to walk by God's Spirit and His way? Do you know that a Christian, somebody washed by the blood of Jesus, can choose to live in their sin every single day. Now, it won't be easy. If you are truly saved, you will be plagued by, by guilt and plagued by, by your, the Spirit and plagued by this, this understanding that you are not walking by Jesus' way. But you can choose to do that. You can choose to live your life in sin and live your life far from God. You can choose to allow your stress and anxiety and, and worries of this world to push out the focus of the kingdom of God. You can let yourself push Jesus down in your life. You have to make the decision. With gr the great power of the Spirit in you, the power that Jesus Christ gives you, the obligation to live in His way, you have to decide every day to put to death the, the life that you have. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer me who lives, but Christ lives in me. That was a combination of Jesus' work to save Paul and Paul's decision to put to death the flesh, okay? Jesus Christ said, take up your cross when? Daily and follow after me. We have to make a decision our responsibility is to choose the life that Jesus Christ has called us to. Our responsibility is to choose to put to death our desires every day to focus 
on his desires. This is one of the ways that we combat this, this, this issue of doing the things that we hate. This is one of the ways that we focus on God rather than ourselves. This is one of the ways that we can address the issue that Paul has in chapter 7 of doing what he hates and not doing what he loves. Next, we can see in verse 14, the simple point that I've entitled this is the sons of God, the children of God, are led by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 14. For all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. Now, that's a simple statement, right? And it may be one of those statements where we would say, duh, of course. But what Paul is saying here, what Scripture makes clear, is the number one sign of somebody who who is saved by Jesus, who knows him as Lord and Savior, who's made him the Lord of their life, is that they walk by the Spirit, that they walk by God's will, that they uh, live the life that Jesus has called them to. If you want to dig a little deeper into that, go back and watch some of our weekly devotions in the book of Colossians from this week. We can see that Paul lays out for us what it is to walk in the knowledge of God's will. What it is, I would say, if we walk in the knowledge of God's will, we are being led by the Spirit of God, right? It's, it's the same thing being said in two different ways and two different levels. But if we, if, if we walk by that knowledge of God's will, if we're marked by that in our lives, we, uh, the world will see that we are God's people. The clearest example of being changed by God is being changed by God, okay? But what does it mean, really, right? We use this phrase, well, I'm walking by the Spirit. I'm trusting the Spirit. I'm seeking God's... Well, we use these phrases all the time, but what do they really mean? Just like we talked throughout the week about seeking God's will and what it usually looks like or what we mean when we say it, I think as we we claim to walk by the Spirit, we're we're saying a lot of the same things, right? Usually we're saying when we're seeking God's will or I'm trying to walk by the Spirit, we're saying I'm trying to, to make this big decision, I'm trying to figure out if I should take this job or marry this person or live in this house or move from this town. I'm trying to make decisions in my life. I'm trying to let the Spirit lead my decisions. I'm trying to follow God's will. I'm trying to find God's will. But Scripture never, ever describes it that way. When we read about what it is to follow the Spirit, when we read about what it is to walk in God's will, Scripture defines it. Paul defines it for us in Romans here, in Colossians chapter 1, in Galatians, I think it's Galatians chapter 4, but in Galatians as well, Paul's uh, 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 description of what it is to be led by the Spirit of God, what it is to walk by God's Spirit, what it is to live in God's will, it's not about making big decisions, but it's about our daily rhythms and a lifestyle devoted to Jesus Christ and His plan. To be marked by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, is not to make the right big decisions, but it's to live daily by the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, it's 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 to, to serve one another daily, it's to follow God daily, it's to walk in and the, 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 the things that he calls us to, prayer, scripture, evangelism, service, silence and solitude, meditation, fasting. It's to let our lives be marked by these things that God has called, this way of life that God has laid before us. It's not just about big decisions. Now, the big decisions come, the answers in our lives, how we know what to do and how to live, come from a life lived following God's Spirit. All right, We have to reorient our minds if we truly want to live and follow God's Spirit and live by the Spirit of God. We need to also stop for a minute and talk about the Holy Spirit here. Uh, up to this point, uh, coming into Romans chapter 8, Paul has only mentioned the Holy Spirit two times in this book, all right? And in chapter 8 alone, he mentions the Holy Spirit something like 20 different times, right? I think that's significant, right? Don't you? Mm-hmm. I hope so. I, I, know, I hope you're all responding. I, I can see over here in my peripheral that people are putting stuff on Facebook. Sorry, I can't stop and read it or I'll get distracted. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but I can see you there making comments. 
All right. The Holy Spirit is essential. And this is going to be another one of those silly statements, but the Holy Spirit is essential to walking by the Spirit. It's not under your strength. It's not under your power. It's not under who. Yes, we make a decision to follow the Spirit rather than our flesh. We make a decision every day to put ourselves to death and live in light of Jesus Christ. But it's the power of the Spirit, not your power, not your strength, not your ability. The Holy Spirit is the one that leads, directs, and guides you to live in in, in in, in, in in communion and in fellowship and by God's Spirit and in God's will. You have to let the Spirit lead you in order to walk by the Spirit. Should be simple, right? It is simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. And we make it far too complicated. Being led by the Spirit is not so much a, a, a direction, but it's a sign of sonship and the power of God. Childship, okay? We're sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Christ. And that's the assurance that Paul is going to give us. When Paul looks at this, he, sa he, he, he says, we have to put to death the flesh and live by the Spirit. We, we have to let our lives be guided by the Holy Spirit, right? But, uh, in order to walk in the way that we know that God has called us. But he also gives us an encouragement here, a reminder here of who we really are. Because if we listen to this world, if we listen to Satan, if we listen to the noise around us, if we listen to Facebook and Instagram, and I'm not opposed to those things, we're sitting here live on them right now, but if we listen to this, this influence in our lives, we're going to have a distorted view of who we are, if we can even see ourselves at all, right? We look, we look at the world around us, and they're going to tell us the exact opposite of who we are. But Paul reminds us, if you're having difficulty giving in to sin, if you continue to fall and do the things you hate, just like me, if you fail to do what God's called you to do, just like I fail to do, take courage, take heart, be encouraged, because you are adopted sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. The third point is, we have received a spirit of adoption in Jesus Christ. Look at these verses, verses 15, 16, and 17. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit. What we are, at, at, that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. We are adopted sons of daughters. Look at the contrast here. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but a spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Look at the contrast that Paul makes here. The spirit of slavery, we've already, we talked just the other day, we've talked a few Sundays ago about the redemptive power of God. Remember, Jesus Christ bought us from slavery to his life. He bought us away from the slave master, the sin and the, and, and the power that held our lives. He bought us for his glory and for his kingdom and for our lives. We are no longer bound by what held us back. And, and we don't have time to go into all the details of fear in our lives, but I believe that fear is the number one motivator that holds us back. We're afraid of failing before God. We're afraid of failing before others. We're afraid of what other people will think. We're afraid of what our church will think. We're afraid of what our bosses and, and classmates and coworkers will think. We're afraid of stepping out in faith. We're afraid that maybe I'm going to fail. Maybe the Bible's not quite real. Maybe Jesus is not actually going to do everything that he said. Maybe he will abandon me. We're afraid. And Jesus, Paul says that through Jesus, through the spirit that lives in us, we don't have that fear. We, we can't have that fear. That is broken. The power of that fear that holds you back is gone. You know what it is. Paul is struggling with this. When you continue to fall into sin, what do you do? Rarely do we get back up and say, God, I'm ready to go today. After day after day of failure, we, we want to lay in bed and we say, I'm just a filthy sinner and I continue to make the same sin. I know you. I, I know you. I know you have the same struggles that I do. And, and we struggle and I, oh, I can't get it right. I'm just going to give up. And Paul says, don't give up. Take heart. Don't go back to the, the slavery of fear, the spirit that used to hold you. Instead, you have received a spirit of adoption. What does it mean to be adopted? 
It means that somebody, I was watching something, I don't even remember what it was right now, but I was watching something and they were talking, somebody was talking about being adopted and struggling with adoption and struggling with the fact that they were, uh, 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 somebody um, gave them up. Somebody didn't want them. If you've been adopted, maybe you've re- you can relate to some of those feelings that somebody abandoned you. Somebody didn't want you. But the takeaway from the whole conversation, from this other side of the conversation, was not that somebody didn't want you. If you've been adopted, that means that somebody chose you. Most of you know that that our daughter, Jaylee, we've we've adopted her, and and, and we've had her since she was born. We took her home from the hospital, but uh, just... Well, just last year, we were able to finalize all of that and have the adoption uh, uh, completed. And as we stood before the judge, the last thing he asked us was, you're going to take care of her. Essentially, he was saying, you are choosing to keep this daughter as yours forever. And we had to say, yeah, we choose. Now, we, we, in, in a sense, we chose to have Samuel, our son, but we didn't get to pick him out, right? We, we didn't have the same choice that we had. We, 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 when you have been adopted, somebody stopped outside of the natural biological way to have children and said, I choose you to be mine. If we look at the first century, there, there, there isn't adoption in the Jewish world like there is in our world. But in the Greek world, it's, 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 it's very similar. And, and when you adopted somebody, in some states here, even now, in some laws, but, it, but in, the, in the Roman world, when you adopted somebody, they actually had greater claim to your inheritance and your name and who you were than your biological children. When you adopted somebody, you were not able to. To, to, to disinherit them, right? And in some states and some places in the United States and maybe around the world, it's exactly the same. You can go to your biological children and write your will and say, you don't get anything that's mine. But as Paul writes this, the crowd that listened, the Romans who heard this, that knew the law of adoption, knew that when you adopt somebody, it is impossible to remove them from your will. Paul says, you continue to fail, you continue to, to, you continue to fall into sin, you continue to miss the mark, but you're still adopted children of God. You can't do anything to stop that. God can't do anything to stop that. Jesus can't do anything to stop that. The world, no power that exists can do anything to take you from the adopted gift, from the reward that you have, from the spirit that lives in you. You are a son or a daughter of the king, and no one can change that. Jesus said in John, he, he said, he said uh, my children hear my voice, my father has placed them in my hands, and nobody is able to take them out of our hands. You, as God's children, are there. No matter what you do, no matter what happens, no matter how deeply you fall or how great you fail, you are His, and He will never let go. And that's the encouragement that Paul gives. If you continue to fall into sin, if you continue to fail, take heart. Yes, seek to defeat that sin in your life. Put your flesh to death and choose to walk by the Spirit, choose to walk in the knowledge of God's will, but take heart that no matter where you fall, you will never lose your place as an adopted son or daughter of Jesus Christ. By that same Spirit, he says, we cry, Abba, Father. What he's saying, this is an Aramaic word, uh, uh, an intimate word for, for Father that children would say to their Father. This is the word that Jesus cried out from the cross as he was dying Father, Abba, Father, right? This is uh, uh, like in, in, in our terms, we would say Daddy or Dad, right? You know what I mean? For, for most people, it, it almost sounds strange to call their father, Father, right? You say, hello, Father, how are you doing today, right? Some, some of you do that, and I don't want to belittle that, but, but most of us call our parents Dad, Mom, Daddy, Mommy, whatever other name you can think of, right? But, but, but this is saying that Paul is saying that he's adopted you, he's chosen you, you can't lose it, and you have a special, intimate, loving, deep relationship with God. 
I'm going to come back to verse 16. He says, if we're children, we're also heirs. And if we're heirs to God, we are co-heirs with Christ. That means that the reward that awaits Jesus Christ, the, 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 the resurrection from the dead, the, 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 the fellowship with God that Jesus receives at his death, the, the gift and the love and the power awaits you and me as children of God. I don't know every detail of what that means to be a co-heir with Christ, but I know it's really special. And I know that God places that on our lives with, with, with such love and such care. And as chosen children of God, we look forward to the blessing that Jesus Christ experiences in the presence of God today. Paul gives us a little reminder at the end of verse 17. By the way, if you want the reward, you have to experience the suffering. That means that we choose as Jesus chose to follow God's will. Remember in the garden as Jesus prays, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. That's the prayer that we have to pray as sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. That is how we defeat the power of sin in our lives that Paul describes in, in chapter 7. Doing what we hate, not doing what we love. This is one of the ways we stop and we say, I am dead to myself, I am alive to you, and I will choose your will over mine. But let's take a step back and go back to verse 17, 16. Paul says, The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. If you forget, if and trust me, I know sin leads to despair and despondency. Sin leads to isolation. And if you're at that point where you've fallen so deep into sin that you can't even see God's love, you can't even uh, remember what it's like to experience his fathership and his love and be a son of the king, if you can't remember what that feels like, if you can't even claim it for yourself, remember that, that you testify to who you are in God. But the spirit within you is standing right next to you. Uh, uh, th this gives me the image of the spirit saying, don't forget who you are. Brooke, when, when you're defeated and down, the spirit says, Brooke, don't forget who you are. But you are the, the adopted daughter, the adopted son of Jesus of God through Jesus Christ. You are co-heirs with Jesus. I am who you say I am. Yeah, we are. The Spirit is testifying along with us. We claim the truth of Jesus Christ, and the Spirit claims it with us and claims it for us. And, and Jesus Christ himself, even as, as Paul is going to remind us later, that he stands at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. We are not defining ourselves on our own, but we remember and we look to, to who we are, who the Spirit encourages, who the Spirit calls, and who the Spirit reminds us we are in Jesus Christ. Christ, if you are, are trapped in sin, as Paul can totally understand, if you feel exactly what Paul claims in Romans 7 when he says, I do the things I hate, but I can't do the things I know I should do and I long to do, this is for you. Choose the responsibility and power. With great power comes great responsibility. The Spirit, Jesus Christ has saved you, but you have to choose to put to death the flesh in your life. With great power comes great responsibility. The great, the hallmark, the mark of a child of God is that they walk by the Spirit. If you're trapped in sin, if you don't have hope or you're lost in despair, turn to God. Follow His path. Learn about the knowledge of the will of God. Let the Spirit lead you and direct you, and you will be able to defeat sin. And maybe you're so far gone that you can't even remember who you are are or who you're, you're saved by and who created you, who loves you. Remember, the Spirit cries out for you and with you, saying you are adopted son and daughter. God chose you out of this world. God chose you in the midst of your sin, and, and, and He strengthens you to overcome sin and death. He is the one who will complete the good work He started within you. He knows you and will not leave you behind. He will help you and strengthen you and enable you to defeat this sin that's in your life. You can look forward to the sanctification that grows in you now, the holiness that grows into you now, and the, the, the crown of glory that we will receive one day 
in heaven. If you're with us today, I pray that you would seek God, that you would seek His will and walk in His path, that you would be obedient to the Spirit that encourages you and calls you, that you would put to death the fleshly desires and choose to walk by the Spirit. That you would be able, as, 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 as Paul, who can be honest and say, I have difficulty, but that you might find victory over this sin. That you might find freedom from the bondage of your old life, your old flesh, your old self. That you might truly experience the gift that God has for you through Jesus' sacrifice. And if you're with us today and you have no idea what we're talking about, you just see some crazy guy uh, shouting and rambling from, from the Bible, you're, you're kind of right. I'm a little, a little crazy, and, and everything that I'm saying is directly from the Bible. But it's not rambling, it's not random, but it's directed by God's Spirit, and it's for you today. If you're out there and you're lost and you're alone, you're bound by fear, you're still trapped in the slavery of this world, you're still stuck in the difficulty and the struggle and the, and the burden that holds you back, if that's you today, the gospel is waiting to bring you life and to bring you salvation. The gospel is there ready for, to give life to you and to save you from your sin. Jesus is ready to say, I will save you today. All we do, the scripture tells us, Paul tells us in Romans 10 that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If that's you today, I implore you and beg you, put your faith in Jesus today. Don't wait. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day when Jesus is waiting to save. He's waiting for you to accept his gift. He's waiting for you to say yes to him today. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we come before you. I thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word together, to come before you in song and in prayer and in the word of God. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and our eyes and our minds to your truth, that we would be faithful to say yes to you today, that we would be faithful to follow your path. God, that you would, would encourage your saints and save the lost and save those who do not have you. Father, we, we pray that you would work, that you would be at work in the midst of this pandemic in incredible and powerful ways, that you would be faithful as we know you are. We love you, God, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Facebook, I know that you've been disconnected at some point, something wrong with the network, but you'll be able to catch the end of this. I'll put a full video up uh, later on today so you can see the end if you missed it. Uh, we pray that you would join us, that you would continue uh, to meet with us Monday through Friday at 11 o'clock. We'll have our devotional continuing to walk through the book of Colossians. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to, to meet on Wednesdays at 630 for our prayer meeting and Bible study. And we'll be here every Sunday at 1045 in the morning, no matter what comes, no matter uh, what difficulties arise. And we look forward to the day that we can, the day that we can join again physically together in prayer and in praise and in worship and in the word of God. I love you all. Have a blessed day.